All right. Hey, everyone. Um, thanks for tuning in. Thanks for waiting. Um, for those who are tuning in, welcome everyone in. So my name is Edwin. I'm your host for today's Coin Store Parley. Um, this is our very first episode. It's a pleasure to have a D legend himself from Miranda here with us today, Michael McCarthy. So I have to ask you the prerequisite question for every interviews that you've probably been attending to. Um, perhaps you can walk us through a bit about yourself your role at Mirandas, and perhaps tap a bit about what Mirandas is all about. Michael, please. Well, my name is Michael McCarthy. I'm the game director of Mirandas. And um, do you want to know a little bit about what a game director role is, Edwin, or just my history? Perhaps let's talk about that, right? It's not every day that we can find out what a game director does, especially in the blockchain space. <laughs> um, so uh, oftentimes at, at different game companies, they'll have different titles uh, for the role. Uh, sometimes they're called an executive producer. Uh, sometimes they're called a general manager. And sometimes they're called a, a game director. But it is the person generally who is in charge of making sure that the product is a success. And... Um, you know, in, in the case of, of Mirandus, and I think a lot of games, especially when they're in production, uh, it's good to have a game director who also functions as what they call the vision holder. So I talk with the community quite a bit and uh, done a lot of the kind of design and creative thinking. I can see the game in my mind, and that really kind of helps uh, helps function as a bit of a North Star for, for the development of, of the team. Right. So, I mean, for those who wouldn't know, right, so what's the differences between, like, being a game director in a game five space as compared to your traditional um, game director at the different games out there? Is there a difference or is there any, you know, similarities as well? A lot of it's very similar. Um, you know, uh, a lot of it is just working really closely with great designers and engineers and artists and trying to to make a an awesome game. Uh, I think where where things are are very different is how do we tie blockchain into the game and empower people to really own their own content, own a piece of the game. Um, that's that's really new that's that's quite new so yeah <laughs> right okay so i mean for those who don't know um i mean for mirandas it's a game five game so i think for the gala gamers you guys will probably know what mirandas is all about for those who are tuning in you guys are probably fans of the game so for the coin stores out there you know do check them out do visit gala games to find out a bit more about mirandas perhaps this is also the whole purpose of this you know, coin store palette itself, right? We're gonna deep dive into the intricacies of the game. Um, so for those who are tuned in, do check out our Twitter as well. Um, there's a really, really, really simple giveaway that's going on. Um, so yeah, Michael, before we, we go deep dive into the questions and the technicalities of the game, um, perhaps we can have a quick sneak peek about what Mirandas is all about, right? We have the video that is lined up for you guys. Um, so yeah, let's view it. My name is Michael McCarthy, and I am the game director of Mirandus, a Gala Games production. Mirandus is a fantasy MMO, which is bringing true adventure back to players. We are creating a dangerous world where death has penalties. We aren't going to tell you what to do or give you a map. You won't find a bestiary on our website. The world is a complete secret for players to explore and share or not. Mirandus is an exclusive world, 
only the finest warriors, crafters, and explorers will have access. For you to play, you must either own or rent an exemplar. An exemplar is your avatar, set in the classic fantasy races of human, halfling, dwarf, orc, and elf. Each exemplar is imbued with special powers, which will help them navigate and conquer. The economy of the world is completely player-driven. If you see a town, it's because a player placed it there. Everything you equip has been crafted by a fellow adventurer. The entire game is powered by blockchain. Blockchain technology finally allows players to own their own content. Blockchain technology allows us to guarantee something is rare. For instance, there are only 1,000 elven exemplars in the entire game, period. If you craft a magic sword, it's yours to equip, trade, sell, inside or outside of the game. The most powerful substance in the game is Materium. It is true magic. All magical acts will use Materium. If you die and want to come back without penalty, you can use Materium. Cast a spell, complete a craft without all the ingredients, teleport an item to a faraway location. Everything magic means you are using Materium. Where is Materium found? On monsters, in chests, and in secret locations throughout the world. Who is making Mirandus? Gala Games has gathered a team of industry veterans responsible for some of the most played and loved games in history. We continue to build the foundational tech and extend content. We release playtests regularly. You must have an exemplar to play and we award players for helping us test. From me and the entire team, thank you. We are working hard to make this the greatest MMO of all time. We look forward to seeing you guys in there. Thank you. Wow, <laughs> um, that's an amazing video from Gala and Mirandas itself. Uh, Michael, how many takes did it take it for you to do the voiceover? Man, and when, don't talk about the voiceover. You know, when you <laughs> when you hear your own voice, it just sounds terrible. I hate hearing my own voice. <laughs> um, I hear you on that. Yeah, uh, you know, but actually, I, I probably I probably did that in one take. Um, maybe two, you know, I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I hate the sound of my voice. Right. I, I wish it could just be pitched down so I'd sound cooler. Right. Um, I usually don't watch my AMAs as well. <laughs> hate the voice <laughs> and everything. It's like, I'll just do the live and then I'm out. I'm out. Um, yeah, I mean, amazing video um, from the Miranda's team. Um, it dabbled. A little bit about what Mirandas is all about. But Michael, before I ask you all the intricacies of Mirandas, um, I have a question for you, right? So when we talk about gaming in gen gen um, general, right? So um, where do you think gaming plays a part in the world we live in right now? Where do I think blockchain gaming fits into the gaming world? Or hmm. yeah, is that, is that what you're asking about? I I think yeah. um I, I think it's just long overdue, um, meaning I, I, what you'll find is that the games that Gala is are, are creating are just as good as every game you're playing. They're all very, uh, they're AAA and uh, the asset quality, the design, everything is is like you're used to. Um, but I think I think it's just long overdue that players should be able to own their own content. And I think people familiar with blockchain understands what that means. And it took me a long time to understand, you know, coming from a, a world where you don't get to own your own content, um, what that change feels like. And, and it, is, it is very, very powerful. So I think, you know, these games fit into the 
fit into the gaming ecosystem the same as any other game that you love. But what you'll find is that when you start crafting, um, you know, an item or you acquire a sword, it really does feel different to truly be able to own it without the power of a gaming company holding it on their server and telling you what you can do with it or not. So I think the games will be just as good or better than anything you're playing out there. And the experience of getting to own your own content truly on chain uh, is, is really where the power, really where the power is. And I, I think all games will be like this in five years. That, that wouldn't shock me. You have to be able to own something. When you start playing games that allow you to own your own content, it is very difficult to play games that don't let you. <laughs> right. uh, so, yeah. I mean, while we are at this topic, right? So when we talk about digital assets, NFTs, um, whatsoever, there's always one side of you know the coin where people are adamant about not stepping into this space, right? So, um, how do you think, or what is Miranda's or Gala Games doing to convince people who you know might find a bit of difficulty trying to understand that this is the new era of gaming? I think. I, I think um, NFTs got kind of a weird name. <laughs> people, you know, some yeah. people are, oh, NFTs, gross, or somebody paid $50 million for a JPEG. It doesn't make any sense. It, it's, not, it's not about NFTs. It's, it's about uh, blockchain. And it's about to understand um, blockchain is really to understand that it is a decentralized network. So the, the power of that is that we do not control everything that is happening. Uh, we do not control the things you own like other game companies will or, or do. It is put into the player's hands. Players can trade with each other outside the game without even loading the game up. They just own their character. They own the things that they're wearing. Um, so. I think people talk about NFTs, but um, I think the blockchain technology is just going to fade into the background. When MMOs first came out, no one talked about how big a server was. Um, you don't talk about servers. You just talk about, I'm playing a game with friends, and there's a lot of people here. And that was very, very cool. And I think that right now, because blockchain is so new, the conversation about games that empower people to own their own content also gets confused with all of the behind the scenes technology that's required uh, to do that. So I think what will happen is um, a lot of blockchain and crypto enthusiasts understand it, and they're the first ones here in this space. Over time, what you'll find is that people are just coming for the great games and they'll, they'll learn what it feels like to, to truly own something uh, inside the game. It feels very different. And that feeling um, is, is powerful. I remember the first time it happened to me, you know, I, I had an item in a game. The game was not loaded and I wanted to give it to my friend. And I just had my phone out and I just gave him the item from my phone to his. He loads the game up and now he can play with that item. Simple as that. So instead of these terms of service that you're signing in the beginning of these games that we play saying, if you ever uh, do all sorts of things with your character or your assets, we're going to kick you out of the game for all time. Instead of that, just let people, let people own their own stuff. They spend a lot of time, a lot of energy, um, a lot of money playing these games, and they deserve to to own what it is they've fought so hard in the game to acquire. So, I think the technology is just going to fade into the background. No one's going to talk about it unless you're a developer or an engineer or an enthusiast. Yeah. And mostly you're just going to play games and have a nice time, and you'll expect to own your own stuff. Why wouldn't you be able to? Right. Um, yeah, I mean, you're spot on on that. Um, I guess that's what the blockchain space is trying to empower, right? To give 
the empowerment back to the community, to the people. Um, so perhaps let's talk a bit about Materium itself, um, Miranda's NFTs, and how they can be utilized within the game. Because in the video that we viewed just now, I mean, um, there were various classes as well. So perhaps you can walk us through or for people who are still unfamiliar about um, Miranda's in general. So there's there's quite a few ways to um, own and control the world of, of Mirandas. Um, what we're trying to, to create is just a massive adventure for players, a big open world, and we don't know necessarily what's going to happen within it. Um, so players can buy deeds, and deeds are like a town, an empty town with plots. Players that own buildings can go to those deeds and place their buildings on top of them. So in the world of Mirandus, there are no towns and unless a player places them there. And other players place their buildings on that deed and create a little town together. There's no gear that we're selling you on our website. Players have to find stuff in the world and, and craft it. And they own those items as well. So we really are just setting the stage and letting everyone come in and seeing what they do with that world. Um, you also can own an exemplar, which is an avatar that has special powers. All of our 50,000 exemplars have special powers and they're unique. And I think the way players combine those together when they're out in the field is going to be really crucial to their survival. And I think survival is a big part of, of creating this adventure for players. You know, it's, if you die in this world, there are going to be penalties. You know, you might lose experience points. You, um, you know, you're, you have to have penalties in a game or the game just really isn't fun. It's not memorable. And we want to paint a world and create a world where there is adventure and there are heroes. And if it's easy for everyone to succeed, then there aren't really any heroes. It's just a matter of how much time you spend playing the game. So here, I think, um, in Mirandus, we're going to have real heroes. And a, the final piece that kind of ties the world together is, is Materium. Um, this is a classic fantasy MMO, and Materium is magic. So any magical act that you perform in the game requires Materium. If you cast a spell, it's Materium. If you're crafting something and you don't have all the ingredients, you can use Materium to kind of summon the remainder of the ingredients um, and create something that you want. Um, and when you're crafting stuff, you know, you're crafting everything. You know, everything that goes inside your taverns, everything that you're, you're wearing, everything that you might want to sell to other players inside your, uh, your forge or your armory. Um, there's other things that are going to be, um, that are part of Materium uh, besides just crafting things and casting spells, uh, resurrection plays a really big part. So when you die in this game, you come back with a bit of a sickness. You know, you're losing some experience points. It's pushing you back. With Materium, you can use Materium to come back and not have any of that memory loss or any of that hunger that you'll come back with. You'll come back uh, shiny and new, like nothing happened. So Materium is just an incredibly important substance. You can think of it like mana in other games. Um, so any, any magical act in the game is going to require Materium, and it is woven into every kind of mechanic and system that we have. Right. So, I mean, it's, it's really cool how you guys tied into the tokenomics of like Miranda's itself, using it to um, be part of the game utilities. I think that's really, really exciting and a game-changing part of the gaming space. So, I mean, while we talk about, you know, getting gamers and having them be part of the Miranda's ecosystem, um, community is a key component of a lot of the gaming projects out there, or not just gaming, right? I mean, we always, always talk about community. Um, so could you walk us through how like Miranda's engages and connects with your community? Because I know the Miranda's community is really, really strong. So, you know, what are some of the things that you guys do with the community? Um, yeah, our community is really freaking awesome. Um, and, and normally what happens, Ed, when, when you're making games is that you, you know, they call it going dark. You kind of disappear with your development team 
and uh, just emerge years later with some marketing videos and, hey, the game's almost done. We, we really didn't want to do that. Um, we've, it's been our experience as game developers that everyone is kind of excited to learn how games are made. And we thought, man, what if we just started building Mirandas and just showed people everything that we were doing and talking to them about, you know, things that are easy to do, things that are hard, what went well, what didn't. And we, we started to kind of reach out. And I, I would say Discord is really where you can find the development team. I'm there as often as I can. And we started just kind of building the community and talking with them about uh, Mirandas. Here's the vision of the project and showing them stuff that you'd never get to see. Normally, game developers would never show something in progress or ugly. Um, but instead, I think it's been really, really cool to just show them everything that we've been doing all along the way. And I really count on them. I feel like the game is not ours. It's more we're developing the game with them. It's something that we want to play as a game team, but we're really making it uh, for the people who have been there and loved and supported us since the beginning and who are coming on board now and are excited about this project. So you'll also find us in Discord. And if we've got some cool ideas or I'm not sure about something from a design side, I'll just reach out to the community and be like, hey, guys, what do you what do you think about this? Do you think this is a good way for this to work or not? And we just kind of have an open discussion um, about the development and about our design ideas. And it, it feels really, really wonderful. It feels wonderful. So all my, all my Discord it's, homies out there, hi. <laughs> <laughs> for those who have yet to join the Discord channel, you guys know what to do, right? So yeah, I mean, uh, it's great. Um, so we spoke a bit about these success stories, how you guys engage with the community. Um, Michael, but could you share with us some of the errors or like challenges that you face, I mean, alongside with your development team while you guys were programming Mirandas? Let's see. There's a lot, Edwin. There's, you know, it, it's, <laughs> you never, you never, making games is never the same every time. It's a bit like a puzzle. Um, and, and a lot of times what you do is you try to bring on really senior level people who have made a lot of games because they can do a better job of looking into the future and predicting how what you're developing is going to actually play and, and work long term. So we, I think we've spent, so things that have gone well is I think we spent a lot of time trying to gather people that all have, you know, 10, 20 years experience making games. Things that have been a challenge on this particular project, um, one world is very challenging. Uh, so normally when you play an MMO, you're choosing a server and they locate servers all over the world. And that way, you know, you're uh, communicating with a server that's very local to you. So latency is very low. And, um, but our players really don't want that. Um, they really, they want to know that Mirandus is a world that you are teleporting to and that you're all there together trying to experience it and unlock its secrets. And so everyone was very keen on it being one world, which I like a lot, more like EVE Online. You know, you feel like you're, it feels different. You feel like you're all in the same universe. Uh, so that has a lot of challenges with it. You know, the latency between um, certain locations on Earth and I, and I, forget which ones are the worst, but I thought it was Sydney to South Africa. You know, everything you're communicating has to go through data centers and data centers and data centers, and sometimes uh, often a round trip of information. So we've, um, Jason Hughes is awesome and our engineering team is awesome. And we've, we've employed some pretty cool tricks to uh, have that latency there, but I don't think you'll see it or feel it uh, or notice it in a way that, um, uh, that you would in other games. Um, so, you know, you, that, that, that tech exists, that's a challenge, uh, having it be one world. And because of that latency, we, you know, have to design a slightly different combat system. Um, so what one world is a, is a big challenge. That's a big challenge. Uh, I would say, okay. trying to think if there's another one that's been tricky, uh, motion matching. 
that's been pretty tricky. So motion matching is a way to um, have animation just look a lot smoother. So what you can do in games is you can make loops of things, uh, like a guy idling or a guy looking to his right. That's a fidget. He has a walk. He then has a run. Motion matching is really cool, and some big studios are, are using it. Um, it. It basically tells the character, gives it a bit of a goal or a velocity or a direction to go in. And motion matching ties it all together in a way that makes it look far smoother and more believable. It takes the animation frames that you're giving it and chooses the right ones and tries to put the body in, in the perfect position. So we really want this world to feel physical and alive, Edwin. So having characters really feel like they're connected to the world and moving in a way that makes sense was very important to us. So but motion matching is a is a different way to to think uh, that's that's tricky that's been right. tricky. Um, it, it sounds um i mean these are kind of technical terms to me as well but i can definitely tell that it's it's challenging on you guys end as game developers so i mean if we could dial back time right if we could go back to day one of the developments um is there anything that you have done differently with mirandas Hmm. That's a big question, Edwin. Let me sip my coffee for a yeah. second and think about it. what would I, if I could rewind the clock. And mind you, we started working on Miranda's last spring, really. Um, and, you know, had to build the team up from there. So if I were to go back in time, what would I do different? Sometimes when you're, if you're a game director or you're in charge of a game, um, especially if you're a game director who's functioning a bit as the design leader, the vision holder, uh, your, where you put your effort and energy um, changes the development quite a bit, Edwin. I, I think I really went deep into what Mirandis what the vision of Mirandis would be. And I wish I would have spent more time very early on in the project doing a ton of recruiting. And, and you always divide your time up like that, right? You're in the game or you're evangelizing the game, doing marketing and PR, or you're trying to get people. And, you know, as the team grows, it becomes easier to do that stuff because you just have more people involved in the project. But in the beginning, when, when the team is very small, you really have to divide up your energy. And uh, right now, in the gaming world, it's, it's not as easy to get resources as, as it used to be. There's a lot of game productions out there and a lot of competition for great people. So, and you know, we've gotten them and, and the team is quite large now, but... Um, I think I, I mean I wish I would have I wish I would have pushed harder for more people early on. Um, the first people you get are the hardest ones to find, Edwin. Um, and so Jason Hughes, you know, they're called unicorns in the in, in the biz. They're called unicorns because they're so hard to find. So those first few people that we found were awesome, and but it takes a long time to find a great technical lead of an MMO, great visual leads, uh, great animators. Once you get those guys in place, then usually everything goes really, really fast. But I don't know, maybe I could have spent more time recruiting early on instead of going deeper on game vision. But hard to say, too, because I, I feel like the vision was so clear or clear enough that I could articulate it to, to the community very early on, too. So that was nice. Um, where we are today, Edwin, is, is good. It's in a really good place. The development is going very well, and not all games are like that. So I oftentimes judge my performance by how things, how things are today. And things are really good today. So <laughs> I know I've made some mistakes, but um, 
usually it's after the development finishes where you really become far clearer about what you could have done better in in the past um so right now i'm just so in it day to day um you know we work all the time on the weekends and uh so i'll be able to answer that question better later on edwin yeah um i mean it does feel like a heavy question right whenever i poise this question out to the people that i'm interviewing um but yeah i, I guess we spoke a bit about you know developing the games things that we could have changed um challenges um for those out there who are also interested to kick start perhaps the career in this space right so what do you think are some of the key elements needed to develop a successful game in the blockchain space i i think if you're trying to develop something successful in the blockchain space you need to understand that it's that it's just very new um normally if you're making games out there it's very formulaic you already have a blueprint um, but with blockchain there's a lot of experimentation and you really have to just be open to new ways that games can function and new ways that you can connect with your players so i i still catch myself um it's getting better but gosh you know for for a couple of years um when I first got into this, the blockchain space, you catch yourself just trying to do the normal thing that you know you would do because you've made games for so long. But really you have to kind of break that box and shatter it and constantly be asking yourself, why? If something, oh, you know, if it occurs to you when you're doing a design or when you're making a game that, oh yeah, we're just gonna do it that way. You might be wrong just because you've done it that way in the past or just because you see a problem um, doesn't mean it's actually there and it exists. So I would say the most important thing if you want to get into the blockchain space and start making games is is work with the community. They'll tell you what, what they want and what they're looking for out of this new experience and be very, very open and always challenge yourself to um, rethink things from scratch and have a bit you know a bit more of a a creative mind and the mind of a child i have children and you know they're always so very open to things and they can see things from so many different angles and i think that's just really important just stay open engage with the community and solve the problem um, or the opportunity of how to get blockchain into games in the best way with everyone around you. Um, I will say that development in the blockchain space is different than anything I've ever done, um, meaning the relationship that we have as developers. If you love blockchain and you love empowering people, you come at it with a different mindset and it attracts other people that have that same mindset. Um, it's very open. It's You share a lot with other developers. If there was anything that anyone who's making a game at Gallo wanted from us from from a code or design standpoint we'd be happy to talk with them and and help and you just find a lot of that energy in the space uh, I, I i think that's something people will come to learn if you're trying to empower the people that love your game um you know that that attracts a certain type of person yeah um i can definitely vouch for that i think it's really great experience working with Team Mirandas and the Gala team. Um, I guess for the users who are tuning in, it's not often that you guys can see the behind the scenes, right? When we prepare for um, any AMAs out there, I think it's been a wonderful experience um, sharing from both sides, right? I think we have learned a lot from the Mirandas team as well, um, even to hosting this coin store party itself. Um, I think a lot of us who are tuning in are excited to find out a little bit about the gameplay, right, Michael? Um, I think it's a very special sneak peek that um, can only be featured through this very special partnership that we have with uh, Miranda's. Um, so before we go into 
the secret editor mode that you're going to be sharing with us. Um, for those who are tuning in, um, please do check out our Twitter social as well. There's a giveaway that's going on. It's pretty straightforward, simple mechanics. Go on and sign up and you can stand a chance to walk away with um, some prizes. So Michael, perhaps we can go straight into the editor mode of Mirandis and show us a little bit about <laughs> I'll show you yeah, a little well, bit. Like, wait, I want to get a little bit, little yeah. bit of a secret. Yeah. But, um, I can show. I mean, you know, I will show you the, you know, the game running in editor. We we use Unity. Um, MMOs are, you know, there's a lot of work that happens on the back end, and Unity's a, a good client for our front end. And I can show you a little bit of of the one of the levels we're working on. If people want to see that, totally going to crash because that's live demos. Um, yeah. So the last time we did it, last time we did a little tech test or a play test, we had quite a small area. The next play test we have will be very large. Uh, this is at nighttime. Let me just fast forward time of day and let's get to the. The morning, you can see it a little, a little better in here. This area is quite large that that you can walk around in. We uh, were playing it, playing together uh, Friday or two ago, and my gosh, it was quite a lot to explore. Um, No one's seen this. No one knows how big this this area is. So I'm only going to show you a little a little bit of this Edwin because it's yeah you know kind of cheating for you guys to get to see some of this stuff out here. Um, oh, there's the Citadel of the Sun. Brad from Polyant owns that. He is the Citadel owner. Those are the biggest cities that that you can that you can find. There's another kind of view of it. Um, so you know, a lot of work goes into making these these levels, um, making them fun, making them interesting to walk around in. I shouldn't show you. I'm showing you too much. I, <laughs> I can't show you. I can't show you any more, Edwin. Right. It'll, it'll ruin it'll ruin the experience the next um we, we run they're not really play tests they're more like tech tests so game development goes very slow in the beginning because you have to build a foundation to support the long-term vision of the project uh, once you get to the point where that foundation is stood up then it's just really a matter of creating assets and content and that goes quite fast so right. the last play test we had, what we really needed to test is some of our projectile logic and trying to get, you know, 50 to 100 people walking around shooting something that sends a message to the server. Hit points need to be deducted on a creature because an arrow penetrated its body. And we, we built that and that's going great. This next one, which should be playable uh, at the end of this year, January, probably January. Um, this is going to be a quite large area with we think it's looking like five to six hundred players walking around together uh, ai will have been built and behavior trees and so the creatures will be attacking you back and killing you this time whereas before they were kind of like dummy target practice so the next tech test you know we're, we're targeting about 500 people in each one of these zones this is about 50 times larger than the previous test. Um, and it's going to be a challenge. There's actually going to be a challenge with this play test. And if you can beat it, then there'll be a cool reward for, for players. But I think we're going to tune it to make it real hard. Uh, I asked the community, this is one of those things that we talk about. Uh, I got on Discord and I was like, guys, do you want this to be a challenge? Do you want this to be hard? And everyone said yes. Everyone said yes. So this next test, you know, creatures are going to attack you. You will die. You will have to craft better armor and weapons in order to succeed and thrive in the environment. And it's going to be real hard to, to win. 
but hopefully it'll be a cool adventure. It'll be our first taste of adventure, I think real adventure uh, for our players inside the game. So I'm, I'm pretty excited about it. That's coming along great. Right. I mean, since we are at that, um, is there any chance for the people out there to be part of the 500? Um, gamers would have that would get a chance to be part of the test. That's 500 in the zone. Um, you know, they'll be cycling through. And I, I, I think if you die, we just need to kick you out. Like, let's make this kind of hardcore, you know, for this for this playable demo. Um, so it's 500 per zone. We're going to have multiple zones. There's some caves, a uh, little bit of a dungeon in here, too. So um, I don't know. We'll see how many concurrents we can support. I think it's 500 a zone. There could be 1,500 to 2,000 concurrents at a time. I don't know. We'll have to see. Uh, we throttle it up and down to test our back end and see how well it's functioning. Things like zone transfers. When you go to a new area, you have to load. We need to delete your character in the old world and put you in the new the new zone you're in. So um, if you own an exemplar, you get to play. That's a promise we made to the community. So if you own an exemplar, you'll get to play. And we'll keep it live and running long enough that everyone who owns an exemplar will, will get to go for it and, and try it. Uh, but that is a promise that we've made the community that, that those 50,000 exemplars that, that we've sold, I don't think there's, there's some left on the store, not too many. Uh, those are the first people that will land in this world of Mirandas. Um, and we need to follow through on that promise. I think that's kind of fundamental to, to blockchain gaming too, Edwin, you know, is that make a promise and keep it. And I, I think, you know, I hope our community feels like we're doing that with them because that's important to us. It's important to us. Right. Okay. So um, for those who have yet to get your exemplars, I mean, you guys should know what to do. They could probably get it off the secondary market, right, Michael? There's there's some, I, I think I've seen some for sale on, on OpenSea, um, but there's still some left in the store, uh, I think at Gala.Games. You know, there's not too many left. A lot of them have sold. People are excited, uh, I think, to come in and play the game. Um, and it's, you know, I, I think one of the things that's interesting about this project is, and in talking with the community, it's they don't really want a game, Edwin. They want a world. And that's really what we're trying to build. This is not the long-term vision of Mirandis isn't... Uh, a place where I, I went in, I hit a max level cap, and uh, that was that was it. I switched to a new game. We're we're trying to make a, a real medieval fantasy world, uh, so you can come in here and play games with your friend at the tavern. We really love the idea that you could compose music in the game, maybe even paint. What if every painting that was on the wall in every home or tavern was done by a player, and you could watch them paint it? We love those kind of thoughts and vision. And I, I think players are looking more for a world to be able to be in, similar to you know maybe a sword art online or, you know, um, than just a game where you run around and shoot something. So right. we've been asked before, like, what's the end of Mirandus? And I, um, you know, we, we love the idea that there, that there is no end. We just keep growing the world and making it richer and more interesting and beautiful. Um, that's kind of our goal. Great. Um, we have a lot of burning questions that are flowing in, Michael. Um, let me just pick up a few and then shoot it across to you. Um, yeah, I mean, the first question, I think this one um, from Freddy, I mean, he was asking, um, can you potentially get banned if you do something wrong in Mirandas? Um. I think, you know, I think the only thing that would get you banned from Mirandas is if you were being, saying really awful things to people um, or just being a terrible human. <laughs> <laughs> um, if you, you know, if you want economic control of the game, I think we're not going to be able to stop you. We, we already have some players that like have ideas about controlling the iron market or, you know, I think that's cool. 
Um, right. But if you're being rude, if you're being rude to people consistently, you know, then then we would have to make it that you know you can't be walking around saying awful stuff to people. That that'd be pretty terrible. Um, you know, but what's nice is is the difference between you know a regular game and a blockchain game is is that even if you were saying terrible things or doing terrible things in the game and we said you can't play anymore um we can't take away your things your armor your gear your character is they're yours um it, it exists on blockchain you know a decentralized network there's no flip we can switch i get asked the question edwin hey if i die can somebody loot me and take all my stuff yeah. um you know it's on blockchain so no there's actually really no way that we could do that um you'd have to enter into some sort of contract uh, but you know you can't take things from somebody else's wallet so right. you know, I, I would ban a player if they were saying or doing really inappropriate things um but we can't take your stuff that exists on chain it's yours <laughs> yeah Okay, so um, the next question, it's from Earth, the Kryptonian. Um, he was asking what device are they able to play on? Mobile, PC, what kind of specs do they potentially need to have a smooth gameplay? Yeah, we, uh, we develop uh, on PC generally. So it's very easy. Um, you always want, when you're developing games, you always want to kind of develop for one platform at first it makes things a lot easier so we're we're a pc game first and foremost it's not hard to go to mac once we kind of unlock the, the pc game of it all um it it is a a big 3d world so you know playing it on a phone would be probably too difficult um Having said that, we really like the idea of you being able to engage in the world uh, using your phone. So they, you know, call it like a companion app. Some way, if you were out on the go and weren't sitting in front of your computer, could you pull your phone out and maybe play a game in the tavern with your friends? Or uh, I really love the idea of maybe you could control a shopkeeper. So even if you were on the go, maybe you could kick off crafts or restock your shelves. Um, that'd be really neat. So uh, it is a it is a PC game, and you are going to need a a PC to play it directly if you want to walk around the three D world. Uh, I think we've been very efficient with our asset creation, so it's not going to take the highest end spec that you can think of to play. We'll be able to have fallback you know graphic modes and stuff that um you know should make it that you know as long as you have a decent gaming pc you'll be okay you'll be okay right. okay cool um so the next question is from nomad fury so um he was asking in the world of warcraft the maximum level is 70 right so his question is what's the maximum level of each playable character in Mirandis? and do they come with a skill tree as well? So we we right now are more of a mastery based system. Uh, so the things that you do in the game successfully will increase your mastery. Um, you know, swords, bows. You could be a bow master, a sword master. We don't like the idea of skill trees very much. Um, so what, what what we like is more that you through play become what you want your character to be we don't want to box you in and say you're a barbarian and you're a thief we want you to be able to combine things in an interesting way and then be able to change it and kind of morph yourself into something different to be more successful um, in in a new or different environment so you know as far as a max level goes um the game doesn't have a core level as a player you have levels of of mastery and things that you excel at and that will unlock cool skills and abilities that only you can perform 
especially tied into classes. That's that's a big one. So even classes in our game, we're targeting as uh, as player owned content, things that players could own and trade. So for you to equip, let's say, a fighter class, that would be very easy. If you want to be a warlock, you know, you might need to have a high level uh, of sword mastery and elemental magic mastery. And if you can level those things all up, you can qualify and equip that class. And then you get a bit of a step function um, of additional power. So. Right. We don't have like, um, a, max, a max number, is it? Okay. I hope that answers his question. So when we were at the editor mode earlier on, I think you showed us a sneak peek about the Citadel, right? So I think one of the users was asking if you could share a little bit more about that. Yeah, so you know, players can buy deeds, and deeds are uh, you know little city stamps that you can place around. Some of the deeds are pretty large, uh, quite large actually. But the grandest cities of them all are are the citadels, and a citadel means that you get to be. There's only five citadels. You get to be one of like the five great kings of the land. Um, you have a direct channel to us on Slack. We show you your Citadel while it's in production. We get feedback from you and ask you what it is you want. And then we work to weave you into the narrative and the entire storyline and history of the world. So they're kind of a big, special, cool deal, <laughs> to say the least. Um, so... A citadel is kind of like you get to be a king, you get to have the ultimate city, you get a direct line to us, and you get to be part of the permanent world and narrative. Right. Okay. Um, I think this is a very good question um, from Nomad Fury. I mean, in this space, um, brand collapse, it's a very common thing that we are seeing every other day, right? So um, the question from Nomad Fury is, um, do you guys have any plans to do like crossover partnerships with different brands out there to set in like somewhat of a limited edition schemes for the players? Uh, crossover with other brands. Do, do, do you mean like the um, the game items that, that you can buy in Mirandus might have function in other places? Yep. Oh, yeah. I We love that. That is part of the fun of it. Um, and you can see, you know, at Gala, we've really experimented with that, um, you know, just within some of the games that, that we're working on and we've released. But we love that idea. Um, anything that fits into the world and could be really cool and fun for players, we're, we're usually very excited about exploring. And we think it's fun and cool when other people want to support things um, that are from our game. So. Yeah, we're we're very we're very open. You know, you as a designer or a director, you always have to curate the game. You can't break a game's economy, let's say. Um, but as long as you can keep the game playing well and holistic, and the world making sense and not break the economy, then we love to support stuff from from other titles, and we love it when other titles support stuff from from us. It's cool. It's a fun thing to play with. I think. Yeah. Okay. Um. Unfortunately, we can't answer more questions. So um, for everyone out there, if you still have any burning questions, you guys know where to go. We mentioned that Mirandas, they have an amazing Discord community. So please feel free to shoot your questions over there. Um, I think, Michael, I mean, for those who don't know, um, I think there's a bit interesting and uh, a bit of a sidetrack for Mirandas, right? So we are going to list Townstar on Point Store shortly after this AMA. And I think for those who don't know, Townstar, it's something that you gave birth to. Perhaps you can just give a shout out to Townstar and what is it all about? Townstar is a, Townstar is a very cool game. I uh, worked on it a while back. And it's kind of a global competition of, of town and farm builders. It's a bit of a... Um, uh, if you've ever played an RTS, there's that feeling you get where you're kind of setting up your little machine and your world to 
craft interesting things that are valuable and help your town grow and things that you can share with with other towns and kind of work with your friends to to win and succeed so um town star is uh is kind of a global competition of of uh town builders and see who can do it see who can do it the best right okay thanks for sharing so for those who want to get town i mean feel free to um, get it on our exchange. It'll be listed shortly, let's say three to four hours after this live aim, uh, live coin store party. Um, I guess, Michael, I think to really end off this whole thing, is there anything that you want to shout out about Miranda's before we call it a day for the coin store party? I think the only thing I would say is, uh, you know, come come into Discord and, and uh, check us out it's it's fun we love sharing with with anyone who's interested in how these games are built and why we think it's going to be uh i think the the greatest fantasy world uh, of all time so that's what we're working hard to make happen and anyone who wants to see how that takes shape we we would welcome you and come into discord and say hi our community is really loving and really cool and really smart um, and we'd love to have more people in there Right, thank you, Michael. I think it's been amazing pleasure speaking with you. Um, I hope for everyone who has tuned in or will be watching the live stream after this would have a better understanding of what Miranda's have to offer. Um, for those who have yet to get, you know, your NFTs to play on Miranda's, please go and do so. It's an amazing game and amazing um opportunity for Coin Store to speak about this as well. Michael, it's been a pleasure. Um, and I guess that's the end of our coin store party. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Edwin. Thank you, Michael.